All right, so chapter five in the textbook, Jim Martinet's arguing with critical thinking is called building your case with issues, analysis, and contention. So our cases, you know, are pro or con argument on our topic. You know, for example, maybe universal health care or raising the minimum wage, or should we keep uh, giving military aid to <clears throat> Ukraine? Or I was seeing, watching the 60 Minutes uh, show this Sunday about uh, China and our growing conflict with them and basically how it's up to our U.S. Navy um, to really, really, uh, if there's a war, if they invite, invade Taiwan. Um, the, the, the scary thing was they actually had an internal report that we know that says they, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, which includes all their mil the, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army all together, um, they, they actually have a directive inside the communist government that says they have to be ready to invade Taiwan by the year 2027, right? So they, they, they've been building ships, making missiles, getting all these things ready, because um, it'll be an amphibious operation where they have to attack an island, right, and land troops. Uh, different from Russia and Ukraine, where Russia just invaded Ukraine on land, but the Chinese will actually have to put all their troops on a ship and then go to Taiwan and then invade and take over Taiwan, right? So, all right. And we are obligated to defend Taiwan if they're attacked by China, so it means that we will go to war with China, right? Uh, full on, it'd be kind of like what Russia and Ukraine are doing now. Nobody's going to use nuclear weapons, hopefully, right? But it'll just be, we'll bomb, shoot each other, and and see what happens um and we have you know a bunch of allies on our side uh south korea japan the philippines etc cetera, etc cetera, australia and then um uh the, just then you know so it'll be kind of like yeah world war three maybe all right anyhow um really really scary stuff i was actually it's you don't want to get anxious and like paranoid but the world is going crazy places right now right so you really really have this growing threat from china if you actually um share one thing real quickly if i just google it just to show you that i'm what i'm talking about um, we just go to like is china our biggest threat just ask google and you're going to see that there's a little thing here from the fbi um and you can see that here on voa news china remains top threat in u.s u.s national defense um some youtube videos relating to it from cnbc um forces news and cbs right and a lot of variety of sources all saying the throat same thing right china's a growing threat to national security how ominous is the china threat china poses biggest threat to us intelligent re intelligence report says um china fires back calls the us the biggest threat to world peace and so you can just kind of see that um the tea leaves are forming up um it seems like it's inevitable and i have a son and a daughter and like i was thinking about like they might go be sent off to fight a war in the western pacific right so pretty crazy stuff so i paid attention to that uh what can you do to prepare for that i don't know my dad was a marine um i would say teach your kids to be independent and thinkers and um and to overcome fear um and i think fear of, like public speaking plays into all of that too we'll, we'll actually cover that a little bit uh, later on so let's check out chapter five again all right so um issues you know so we're building a case what was our issue the, you know, it's, it's what we're arguing about um you know who should do it the the bill says the u.s federal government right so we actually know the actor what we call the agent of action right who for example should we promote x raising the minimum wage right uh more carpool lanes how can we solve the parking problems at y or how am i going to the college of my dreams right those are all examples of issues so Let's talk about assumptions and inferences, page 86. This is really, really important to understand um, what an inference is, how it's different from a fact, and also all the assumptions that people make when you're arguing. And I'll give you a quick example of assumptions. Uh, I might ask you, um, Matthew, assume you're the one in here. So thanks for making the meeting again. Matthew, like, are you, do you want to live a long life? I'm going to ask you that question. You can just, you know, answer yes or no, or I'm not sure. And most people are going to answer yes. But think about what are you assuming when I say you're going to live a long life, right? Think about the assumptions that are made. You're healthy, have some money, and have, you know, like freedom. Because what if I told you you're going to live a long life, but you'd be poor as hell, you're going to have cancer, and it's going to be reoccurring, so you'd be in and out of the hospital, spending more money on all your medical bills, right? Um, it's gonna be super stressful. 
uh, on your family and you. And then obviously being physically incapacitated would limit your freedom. You can't travel. You can't go anywhere. You can't just jump in your car, run an errand, right? And so if I told you that your long life is going to be unhealthy, poor, and full of pain and suffering, all of a sudden you might change your answer, right? Because think about you're assuming when I asked you, do you want to live a long life that your life is going to be happy and healthy, right? Your long life, right? That's, those are two big assumptions, right? So it's a good example of how people make arguments, but there's a lot of assumptions behind that argument. And if you dive into those, you can really take the argument apart. So let's learn about inference. Inference refers to something we believe to be accurate based on something else we believe to be true, right? Okay. The sky is blue yesterday, so today the sky will be blue again. And then I look at my window and there's a storm. The sky isn't blue. And you go, whoa, so my inference is wrong. And, the, you know, right? So, so it's just something that people say, hey, I believe this. And because this is true, then this also must be true. So that's how we make an inference from the original kind of like belief or truth, right? So if you email someone and they do not email you back, you may infer that they are mad or upset with you. They ignored me. Why? Right. Uh, inferences can be correct interpretations of our environment or incorrect interpretations of our environment. So akin to opinions, they are not facts. So understand that facts are not inferences and inferences are not facts. Right. A lot of people think an inference is a fact, right, because the inference is based on something that you believe. But then you're, you know, generalizing it over to something else. Um, based on our assumptions, we make inferences that guide our decisions and actions. To make sure these assumptions and inferences are accurate, we need to question them, right? So that's what a good arguer does. Somebody throws an argument out there, you question their inferences and the assumptions that they're making, right? So um, before you begin to analyze a claim, we learned about claims uh, in Toolman's model, right? Claims, supports, warrants, backing, uh, reservations, and et cetera. And so you want to like analyze a claim and then listen, challenge any assumptions you may have on that claim, right? So let's throw out a claim and um, see what kind of assumptions that you're making, right? And then you're going to see that there's a bunch of them. So this useful approach to analyzing claim is known as a key assumption check. And it's a very important starting point at the beginning of any decision you might want to make. And just before you make a final decision, we check those assumptions, right? So people will ask me like, do you want to go to this party on Friday night? Yeah. What are the assumptions? That like my kids don't get sick and then I can't go to the party. You know, that my dogs don't get sick or injured or, you know, that they're they're sick or somebody's watching the dogs, but maybe they cancel on me and then all of a sudden I'm scrambling, right? So you, so you say like, yeah, I'm going to go to the party on Friday night, but there's a bunch of assumptions you're making that like all these things are in place so I can go to the party. And, you know, they should be in place, but you never know in life, right? Things go wrong. Things are chaotic. So kind of just look at all the key assumptions that you're making, right? Um, and um, let's let's look at a scenario. Right. So would you hire a man with long hair and a beard? Why or why not? And what are you assuming? Right. So people who say yes, they're probably assuming not too much. People who say no are assuming a lot, huh? Like long hair makes you unreliable and a beard is like not clean cut. Right. Um, I actually have a beard, but I trim it really short because I don't want it to like look like a Viking beard. I right? just because because you kind of make an assumption that people might look at that Viking beard and assume I'm not a professional, right? And I don't want that image to be out there. So I I trim my beard very, very short um, and, I, and I trim it all the time, right? So think about the assumptions that you're making. Because he has long hair and a beard, what do you assume about him or her? And then how does that affect your ability to hire them or not? Now, imagine you hear a report of a mass murder that involves explosives. Boom. What is your first reaction? Do you assume a terrorist action or infer specific types of ethnic characteristics? Got to be a brown Middle Eastern man, Muslim, right? That did it. Actually, the most common domestic terrorist in America is a white man, right? Uh, usually white supremacists, racists shoot up a you know synagogue or or um, go after you know black people in a Buffalo supermarket or Dylan Roof went after South black um, preacher or sorry black churchgoers at an all black church in South Carolina. Um, and, you know, um, most Timothy McVeigh uh, comes to mind. He was actually given the death penalty. You could cover him in death row case presentations. He blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City and there was a child care center and killed almost 200 Americans with a big truck bomb. And he, he was a white Caucasian male, right? So uh, it's interesting about 
what people assume, right? If you just hear about an explosives reaction, right? Uh, you're like, okay, it's got to be like 9-11, right? Or something like that. So you just see that, that people make assumptions all the time. As soon as you just hear something, it's not true, right? You're just like, oh, 9-11 was a bunch of terrorists, Muslims, mostly from Saudi Arabia, brown skinned dudes, right? Males. Um, so you just, you kind of make these assumptions. Okay. So issues. In argumentative communication, any issue or an issue is in any question or disputed item upon which the final product or conclusion of the argumentative encounter is dependent, right? So it's a way to sort of crystallize the debate into sort of a question, you know, should we raise the minimum wage, right? Should we give uh, military aid to Ukraine? Um, should we do something about North Korea, right? This, so you frame it as a question in order for people to really understand the issue and then the topic and the arguments. So uh, the goal of the critical thinker is to discover the appropriate issues inherent in the claim, right? So you have this claim, we should raise the minimum wage, minimum wage. You know, what are the issues? There's economic issues. There's some small business autonomy issues. There's the role of government issues, uh, maybe even a few others, right? So critical thinkers must know what the important issues are that must be both asked and answered so they can take and argue a specific position on a claim. And you'll understand that to ask good questions of someone who's making an argument, you have to understand the issues really well, right? So critical thinkers got to understand what issues come up here. Um, think about like, I want to go to college. What are the issues? I got to pay for it. I got to get admitted. That means I got to, you know, like pass a bunch of classes and get them to transfer. Um you know, and then I might think about some other issues related to my specific circumstance. Like I want to be close to my family because my mother's sick. And I, so I don't want to go to college 3,000 miles away. I went to college in University of Miami. It was 3,000 miles away from my parents. Uh, I was kind of trying to get away from them. I just needed to really get away from home and grow up. Um, and so you kind of think about like, yeah, I need to go to, I want to go to this college. And you realize what are all the issues that are part of the overall question is like, you know, should I go here? Blank. So general characteristics of issues. Issues are phrased as questions. Cool. Um, thesis statements are never questions, though. So remember, issues there are. Issues need to be relevant to the claim. They need to be connected, right? Um, you know, you can't just bring up Pokemon if we're doing a discussion about pizza, right? Pokemon is not relevant to pizza yet. So issues can be introduced by the pro or con side. There is no set number of issues. You could have 50 or just two or three. Like you're in a relationship, there could just be one issue, right? Like there's a lot of things going on in your relationship, but it's really just one issue. Like I need you to be honest with me, right? Kind of push everything else to the side. Um, and, and an argument about universal health care, there, there are maybe 40 to 50 issues, right? So uh, issues bring organization to the or, uh, argumentative environment. So really, again, again, it crystallizes, it brings organization so that people understand how these different subsets of arguments all fit together and that they're distinct, right? Um, and then sometimes you might say, "I you've won this argue, issue, but you've lost this issue. And then you kind of have to weigh that on your little scales of justice, right? Or what I call the CBA cost benefit analysis. And you weigh all the costs of this decision and all the benefits of this decision. And you realize it's never just an easy one, right? Because if it's like this, it's an easy decision. It's when it's like super close that it gets tough, right? And then uh, issues should be as specific as possible, right? So questions should be as specific as possible. Types of issues are like potential issues, what could happen, admitted issues, things that we know are happening, real issues. Again, these are things that are, are also happening, but also we don't maybe haven't figured out what the answer is yet. And then there are ultimate issues. And these are the ones that kind of decide, right? Like in a relationship, what are the ultimate issues? Like if they cheat on you, are you done with them? Or you forgive and forget, or, or, or forgive at least. And it depends on you know the, the circumstances of the cheating, right? And you, you just figure out what are the ultimate issues in this relationship that are really like, you know, like make, make, it'll make your decision, uh, help you make your decision, right? Whereas a potential admitted or real issue, even though it's true and you've argued it and maybe you're winning it, it's, if it's not an ultimate issue, it won't win you the whole debate, right? Ultimate issues tend to win you the debate. Like in death row case penalty cases, the ultimate issue is guilt or innocence, right? Because guilt means you get the death penalty, innocence means you're, you're free. All right, so effective issues of page 91. So issues, again, need to be questions. Uh, avoid should questions for policy claims, not issues. So policy claims are we should do this. Issue questions don't use the question should, right? Uh, I might ask for minimum wage. How will minimum wage increase affect uh, small business employment? 
How will it affect? It will raise consumer prices. A lot of research says when you increase minimum wages, they the owners of the restaurant pass that cost onto the consumers by increasing price, prices on the menu, right? Um, I live in Sunnyvale. I think the minimum wage is like $17. And if you go to like In-N-Out or Chick-fil-A in Sunnyvale, you'll notice that it's expensive. And that's because they're passing that cost of minimum wage employment onto the consumer, right? Um, now, I know one Starbucks survey, they asked all these Starbucks customers, would you pay, would you pay more for your coffee if you knew that money was going towards the employees? And like 70% of coffee customers at Starbucks said, yeah, absolutely, right? Trader Joe's does that as well. Costco takes care of their employees. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, if you're a consumer, you know that these businesses help pay their employees and, you know, and then they, and they ask you, the consumers to help with that. And the consumers are like, yeah, right. We're cool with that. So only ask only uh, one question per issue. So one, you know, that's why you might have many issues because, because you need to frame different questions, keep issues neutral. They should not be one-sided or other. They're just, you know, a question that doesn't use the word should that we want to answer. Um, avoid starting an issue with because that's actually not even a proper sentence grammatically. Right. So, and then avoid how and why questions. When it comes to issues, right? And then use issues with yes and no answers, right? So should we raise the minimum wage? Yes or no? Will it increase bankruptcies? Yes or no? Does it lead minimum wage workers out of poverty? Yes. But do employers offer you less hours? Yes. And then uh, keep the issues relevant to the claim, right? The issue of relevance is always important. Um, in court, you can't bring up things that are irrelevant. Right. So if you're a criminal and I'm charging you with murder and then I'm going to you know, give you some evidence that you cheated in high school, like a lot, a lot of people will say that's not relevant. Right. What because they cheated on high school academically doesn't mean that they're a killer. Right. That they're a murderer. And that's an un, it kind of biases your thinking because a lot of people will do an inference. Oh, if you cheated in high school, you must be a dishonest person. So dishonest people could be murderers. Right. You see that people start making these logical conclusions by court, not logical. Uh, inferential conclusions, which is why court is really big about any evidence that's irrelevant is not allowed into the court, right? You, If you're a rape victim, they can't really bring in your sexual history at all, right? It's, it's kind of, because a lot of people would say, well, doesn't that kind of matter? Um, maybe, right? Depending on the circumstances of what happened. So anyhow, um, these are just hypotheticals, not taking position. The other those those are called rape shield laws where you a rape victim's sexual past is not relevant in court and they can't bring it up right so i'll give you a good example if you all remember the kobe bryant uh rape trial in the early 2000s you know he's rest in peace by the way um it actually happened in colorado in the judicial district in um summit county where i was working for the judge uh terry recriegel um, yeah, that was crazy. We just had all, you know, like six months, there was press everywhere. Um, so one of the things that came up was the victim. She had panties with uh, Kobe Bryant's DNA and semen in them, right? Which kind of shows that they definitely had sex. But we found out like that same night, she went and slept with another boy, like uh, her, her ex-boyfriend or kind of like, you know, on and off against boyfriend. And that was a big issue. Can we, can the defense attorneys for Kobe Bryant bring that up like prove that's true because it's actually evidence that we because his semen was found in her panties too so on the same day so the inference is like this right think about that like if you got raped would you go sleep with another boy with this in the same night right or the same 24 hours right most rape victims no that's a hundred percent no so it's kind of right think about how it really makes her story look like that was not um rape She'd be all freaking out and not be able to go. She'd be go crying with the boy, not having sex with him too, after having sex with Kobe Bryant, right? It's just like, so, um, and by the way, that evidence got admitted because they said that was relevant, right? That was relevant. So it was like same 24 hour period. That's just, you know, very relevant. Any other sexual history, they, they wouldn't allow it, right? So, okay, uh, why don't we ask questions? So Paul Sloan, lateral thinking expert, um, why people don't like to question people's arguments and statements and, but a critical thinker, we question, right? We question assumptions, we question inferences. So, but why, how come people don't tend to do this? Well, it's obvious that asking questions is such a powerful way of learning. Why do we stop asking questions, right? Well, how, how cause you know, it's intrusive. It's kind of confrontational. Well, let's find out for some people. The reason is that they're lazy. 
They assume they know all the main things they need to know, and they do not bother to ask any more questions, right? So they're lazy. Uh, they cling to their beliefs and remain certain in their assumptions, yet they often up, end up looking foolish. So other people are afraid that by asking questions, they will look weak, ignorant, or unsure. Okay? They like to give the impression that they are decisive and in command of the relevant issues. They fear that asking questions might introduce uncertainty or show them in a poor light. In fact, asking questions is a sign of strength and intelligence, not a sign of weakness or uncertainty. Great leaders constantly ask questions and are well aware they do not have all the answers. Yeah. Um, my brother and I, we used to do a lot of uh, angel investing, which is we personally would invest money into different companies. So people would pitch their ideas to us. And we always played this role where I was, he was good cop and I was bad cop. And I would, by bad cop, I mean, I would ask so many hard questions to the business people. And, and I remember like a lot of times they'd be like, you're an asshole. I'm like, no, I just have a lot of, because if you want our money, I'm going to question everything and make sure I feel satisfied before we hand it over. Right. And if you don't like that process, then no way we're going to give you our money. Right. Because you don't know what's going on. I think you're making a lot of assumptions and or maybe you're lazy or you're afraid of looking weak, ignorant or unsure. Right. So um you're going to find out questions is, a, is what separates a good arguer from everybody else. I'll give you a great example. You will all do student Congress and the video speeches and the briefs will generally be pretty good. And then I'll notice that after you get questioned, though, people fall apart. They look really weak because they can't answer the question. Right. So you see that like people look really good when they're prepared on their kind of brief on their set arguments. But as soon as they get questioned, they don't know how to handle that. Right. And, and this class is really about to really make you a master debater, it's about how to answer and ask questions, right? Because you're going to see that everyone can kind of do a prepared argument. That's not too hard. It's this part, the question and answer process, that really sets everybody apart. And in, in, in court, lawyers don't win by giving great speeches, right? They win by cross-examining their witnesses. And that's, right? So it's the Q&A process that really makes lawyers show, be better than other lawyers, in my personal opinion. Because we're generally, they're all pretty good public speakers and pretty persuasive and pretty professional, right? It's, it's the cross-examination process that you start to set apart. You really notice the differences now, right? Discovering issues, page 93. So we can do brainstorming. That's a process where you, you number one, collect ideas. But you don't judge or criticize any of the ideas that you're collecting. Maybe set a timer for 15 minutes. And then uh, two, after your timer goes off or you have a lot of ideas, we go to evaluation phase and we go through all our ideas. We combine them, eliminate them, or highlight the important ones, right? And then we do a lot of research to understand the issues. So we might do um, brainstorming. You know, research might be checking out procon.org and seeing what all the issues are on your universal health care bill or your nuclear power bill. And that'll really prepare you for your assignments. So brainstorming is, you know, we might just go like, okay, let's brainstorm about um, AI, artificial intelligence, right? So Nobody's, all the ideas we put out there, we're not going to judge or criticize. We're just going to collect the ideas. And then for like, let's just say two minutes, I'll set a timer. And I'm going to type all the, everything I can think of related to AI or artificial intelligence. And then we'll go to evaluation after two minutes and see if we can combine, eliminate, or highlight and kind of figure out what the issues are when it comes to artificial intelligence. So here we go. Let's type in the chat. So two minutes, brainstorming. I'm just going to say uh, killer AI robots, like flying around, killing people that are they're programmed to kill. Uh, you got AI running um, the grid power. You got AI and EVs, what we call autonomous vehicles. That's coming soon too. Uh, let's say AI, what's the chat thing called? Chat GPT. Something, I hope I got that. Um, military AI. Is Google AI or Siri? And I'm going to say no because it depends. And then we got to look at the AI definition. So, how do we know what, what is AI or artificial intelligence? Uh, how about movies about AI? A lot of times they're the future villain, right? That AI takes over the world. They're like these humans, really useless. Let's kill them all. And, you know, like Terminator robots will kind of run the world in AI. So um, also, if you ever saw the HBO show Westworld, kind of had that theme as well. Um, we got 45 seconds left. Uh, I'll talk about um, AI on your phone. 
The basic one is your text messaging predictor. See, it learns you and what you type in text messages and then predicts the words. So that's actually the most commonly used AI in the world last I used because it's all our phone and it's one that we, we almost text message every day, right? So anybody notice, uh, Matthew ever had, you notice this? That like, for example, I typed my son's name, Roman. So the first time I typed it, I had to type it out. But now that I do a capital R, it always suggests Roman, right? Because it's learned me and how what I type and make some predictions based on that. So that's what's been one basic form of AI that's going on every day that most of us use all the time. Um, and then, yeah, so that's time. And then now we've got a bunch of ideas related uh, issues related to our topic of AI, and we can go through them and just talk about, right? Yeah, killer robots. I think we should definitely talk about that. I would highlight that one, AI running the grid. Okay, so this is like a negative. This one's a positive. Autonomous vehicles, again, kind of a positive. Chat GPT, positive. Military AI, kind of a negative, but also positive. Definitions of AI is, is it Google count, the Siri count, what is it? Movies again about AI, uh, and then um, the basic AI on your phone, right? And then you can kind of see that I've got a lot of, I've divided up a bunch of the issues as pro con, and then kind of figuring out what is it, um, and then some of the different apps that are going on in the world. So, okay, so that's brainstorming. Uh, otherwise, you know, do research. So, you know, again, resources will help you understand the issues, especially like Procon.org. So it's a fantastic research, by the way. Uh, resource. So pattern for some patterns for analysis. How do we think about and analyze our, our topics and get issues? Well, well, first of all, we do CBA, which is again cost benefit analysis. What are the costs of the policy I'm entertaining? And then what are the benefits of the policy? And then once I get those all straightened out, I weigh them and then I make a decision. Right after I've analyzed them, right? Priorities analysis. This is again where you figure out what are your priorities, A, B, C, and then you look at all the different things going on. You can figure out if those things don't go towards those priorities, then they're not really relevant anymore, right? So, um, programs analysis goes into goal seeking and then accomplishment of the goals. My goal is, you know, transfer and then graduate from college. And then you, you set about actually accomplishing these goals, which is broken down into a program, right? Where you have to like pass 20 different classes, transfer them all, and then you'll get admitted. And then you need to do like another 20 classes, pass them all within your major, you'll earn your, your degree, right? Um, and that's so you, you start to think about you're in an undergraduate program as a result, right? And then can continuities analysis where you examine past results and experiences, you compare them to make sure that they're continuous, right? So I have tipped um, in the past. So when I go to a future encounter or a current encounter where there's a tipping situation, I kind of go like, well, I've always tipped before. So I'm going to continue tipping today, right? Or you're like, um, I always get popcorn when I go to the movies. Now I'm in a movie theater, I'm gonna get popcorn because I'm gonna continue sort of what my, I, I've done in the past because it, it, you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it? It works, keep going with it, right? So, so let's learn about the stock issues. So these are a good way to look at any policy and kind of look at the basic issues every time. Um, and so we look at claims of fact, value and policy, right? So first of all, you may remember what a claim of fact is. Uh, and claim of fact has two groups of questions. What questions need to be asked to determine if the fact does indeed exist? And then how do the determining questions apply to this particular situation, right? So I ask myself, how do we figure out, my claim is the sky is blue. How do we figure out if that's actually true? We can look, but it depends on where you are, right? Because the weather's different everywhere you are. Um, and sometimes it's nighttime on the other side of the planet, right? So like, and then how do the determining questions apply to this particular situation? Would you say like, you know, generally, if I can observe this and look at the sky, um, that's good enough to prove whether the, the blue is, sky is blue, right? Or I might change my claim to with a reservation says, during the day, the sky is often blue in California, right? And you know, that's a much more specific, truer claim than the sky is blue, period, right? So a claim of value, um, which is against a judgment, as opposed to whether something is true or will exist or has existed, um, we look at these two groups of questions. So what questions need to be asked to determine if the subject of the claim can be evaluated as good, bad, just, or unjust? And these questions establish criteria to be used to evaluate the subject of the claim, right? So we ask questions related to the, the value claim that kind of help us understand, you know, is this good, a good thing or a bad thing, right? And we make a judgment, right? Um, 
should we torture terrorists to get information out of them, right? You know, or enhanced interrogation techniques, as I, I like to call them nowadays. And, and the interesting question is, well, do they work? Does that work? And the research is no, it doesn't. They, they lie because they, they don't want to get tortured anymore, right? And they say stuff. So, um, so you, then you figure out, you know, what, are, again, is the criteria? for these things, right? Like a set of standards. Then how is that criteria that has been established applied to this particular situation? And you can get a, a much idea, better idea of the judgment that you're trying to express through the claim of value. Claim of policy has seven unique groups of issues. So, whoa. And, and student Congress is debating and claim of policy. Should we do universal health care? Should we do nuclear power? Right. And your persuasive speech is also implementing the claim of policy. So you'll see that the claim of policy and some of the issues is really, really important to understanding your argumentation assignments. So ask number one, does a problem exist? The first set of questions we ask to determine if there's actually a problem that needs to be fixed. Is the perceived problem just a minor difficulty in the status quo? Right. So like. You'd be surprised how, to a large degree, people will complain about stuff, but it's their minor inconveniences. They're, they're always, what I like to say, first world problems, right? And it's like, does a problem really exist, right? That you need to change, you know, our society. Uh, and then number two, is the problem significant? So one set of questions examines the impact of the problem. So the problem is true, but it only affects like a couple people, right? You're not going to do a national policy for that at all, right? So the problem is true, but it's not significant, right? So how important is the current problem that is being addressed by this claim? Is the claim focusing on a major problem or just an inconvenience? If the current situation is costing you or others money or time, you need to ask questions to determine how much, and if that is a significant number. Like, how many of us have called a company to get a refund if, for, if it's like 10, 20 bucks? And then, you know, I don't know if you ever do that, but it's a pain in the ass, huh? For them, or like to try and cancel subscription. I don't know if you saw, but in the world, it's super easy to sign up, but they make it almost impossible to cancel subscriptions, right? And um, it's the, the way the whole system is set up, the law allows them to do that, right? So, but you ask yourself, is that enough time that we're all being annoyed that we should actually change the law? And then is the problem significant enough to warrant the resources needed to solve it, right? So you realize, like, okay, there's a lot of this is a real problem. But trying to um, fix it is going to cost a ton of money. So you kind of go like, it's a problem, but the solution is so expensive that you go like, dude, we, we have to tolerate the problem, right? And this is actually a type of cost-benefit analysis. And a second set of questions may look at the future significance of the problem, because the problem may not be bad now, but if untreated, like climate change, how significant can the problem become? And the, there's a new UN climate report that says by the year 2035, if we don't take steps today, we may be doomed like our planet is doomed which means everybody on the planet dies right and so i think hopefully like we realize climate change is really really important for everybody and we need to stop being selfish and um we have to move to make some big changes to to figure this out anyhow uh and that could be your persuasive speech topic too and a nuclear power topic as you relate to this because remember the main reason if you read the nuclear power bill for student congress the main reason we want to build nuclear power is to reduce our carbon uh pollution so we can reduce the effects of climate change so that's all tied into that, that student card number two. Um, and then third, you ask yourself, is the problem structural or attitudinal? Is, is there a problem with the status quo structure that makes this problem always occur? Or is it, there's an attitude within the status quo that creates this problem, right? So is the source of the problem structural caused by rules or regulations, or is it attitudinal caused by what people think or their traditions, right? Try, by the way, there's a that's a stupid argument that we've traditionally done something, we should keep on doing it. The world is such a different place, right? Like traditions are kind of stupid in my opinion. Um, I think they're cool in your personal life or like to have a family tradition, right? But be like, you know, we step, let's do, let's have slavery again. It's a tradition, right? Because first 140 years of our country's, you know, birth, we had it, right? Or traditionally, we don't allow women to work, right? You can see some of the traditions are terrible. So I'm, I'm being, I'm, we have, I used to have a saying that trad is bad, right? Traditions are bad. Like that, not again, not family or personal traditions or friend, right? But like social ones or like uh, na national traditions, right? We sing the national, the, the Pledge of no, sorry, the national anthem before most sporting events, right? It's kind of interesting because the NFL, the sports leagues like to do that, it makes them look patriotic. So if you change that, a lot of people will probably get annoyed just because of the change, right? So, 
Um, and remember, if the problem is caused by attitudes, then the issues ask how deep are the source of those attitudes and can they be changed through persuasion or is there a change or do we need a change in the law or the procedures needed, right? If like for Black Lives Matters, do cops have an attitude problem towards when it comes to race, right? And you might say that's what's causing the Black Lives Matter movement to be needed because so many people get shocked. Innocent black dude, it's really lame, huh? Without if we and if we didn't have video evidence of this happening, it, it's been going on for hundreds of years, by the way, and it would still go on. The cops would just keep on doing it, but because there's so much video evidence now, unarmed people getting shot in just the wrong circumstances, you're seeing a lot of change happening. At least we'll see. Uh, some of the police officers are being punished though for what's going on, so um, and that used to never happen. Uh, and then four, can the problem be fixed within the system? Instead of adopting the claim, we can just make a minor adjustment. Remember, this was called a minor repair. We're not going to do minor repairs in this class, but it is a claim of policy issue. Again, can we just, we don't need to change the entire status quo. We just need to put a little Band-Aid on like a minor repair and everything will work better, right? It's like my dam is leaking. I shouldn't tear down the dam and build a new dam. I should just repair the old dam with a small minor repair and prove that that actually will work, right? It just won't delay the problem. It actually fixes the problem. Number five, is there a workable solution to the problem? This is what we call like solvency. Can we solve this problem? Because sometimes there is a problem, but the new law, the new proposal, or new policy won't actually solve the problem, right? Because, you know, it's, it sounds good on paper, but it just doesn't necessarily work uh, in reality. Um, does the person advocating the claim have an actual plan to solve the problem that the claim is attempting to solve? I'll give you a great example. They're rape in the military. It's terrible. And it makes the military look terrible. And they've been trying to do something about it, but the numbers are still bad, right? Despite all their efforts. So I'm just going to stop the share and we can just take a look at that real quick. Oops, share screen. Why is that not working? I'll just go to um, rape and assault in the U.S. military. Um, and you can see there's a hotline now you can call 1-800-656-4673. Um, but here it is, right? They're actually up 13%. So they've been trying to go, make it go down and it's actually going up. Right. And, and so you kind of go, it's a poison in the system. It's underreported. Um, so you ask yourself, is there a real solution to sexual assault in the military? Because they've been trying, they've been doing all sorts of stuff, and it's actually doing the opposite. It's it's increased, right? So, um, yeah, that's a tough one, huh? That's a really, really, really tough one. Part of me is like, all you ladies, don't join the military. It's full of freaking sexual predators, right? Um, then number six, will the plan solve the problem? Is it enough to just have a workable plan? The next series of issues explores the effectiveness of that plan. For example, you ask questions like, can that plan actually reach the objective in the claim? Are there other aspects not covered by the plan that would interfere with the solution suggested in the claim, right? So, um, you know, for marijuana legalization, one thing that happened that they didn't really understand is the black market. That even if you legalize recreational marijuana, but if you tax it, it creates a black market because people don't want to pay the tax and they want to get it cheaper. Everybody always, you know, generally buy things for cheaper. They're economically incentivized. And so there's a huge black market um, when you tax legal marijuana. So you, because everybody, and why do they legalize marijuana? Everybody was like, we want the tax revenue, right? So they're not actually getting it. So that, that all the reasons to legalize marijuana haven't really come to fruition. Right. So number seven, will ramifications outweigh the positive effects? Uh, for example, here are 15 uh, ways that minimum wage reduce poverty, but cost jobs, says the Congressional Budget Office. That's the CBO. So you see that, for example, OK, the raising the minimum wage would reduce poverty. But what happens is those are the minimum wage workers that keep their job, because when you raise the minimum wage, the employers will cut the jobs because each job costs more money. Right. So there's a trade off. Right? And you kind of understand that the pot will will there be a trade off between when you put this new law in change the situation where the negative as a side effect comes up and actually outweighs the positive effect, and then that pretty much makes the whole thing counterproductive.
So you shouldn't have done it. Contentions, page 101. So this is an issue that has been answered with analysis and research, right? So you have an issue with an answer, that's your contention. So contention is a main argument that supports your position on the claim. For example, in your main body, in your student Congress brief, you might have three contentions, right? In your main body, contention number one, contention number two, contention number three. Uh, contentions mostly come from the ultimate issues, right? Those are the ones that decide the debate a lot or the argument. Contentions become justifications for a position on the claim being argued. Contentions reflect the logical organization of the arguments that you're making as part of your position on the claim. And then contentions should flow from one to the next, advancing the overall case for your side, right? So I have, you know, like three contentions why we should support military aid to Ukraine. So number contention number one is Russia is one of our enemies and we need to contain them. And, and we're a member of NATO and NATO has kind of been put faced, you know, whether you like it or not, it's kind of the East, West, Russia, NATO, US conflict. Uh, contention number two is that um, this is a war on democracy. So if we let, if we don't fight it here, it could be fought in other places, including our own home front. That's what the Ukrainians often say. So they're like, give us weapons and ammunitions. Uh, and then contention number three would be that the Ukrainians can win. So that if we help them, they can actually beat the Russians, which has these effects, right? Um, but the one we don't want is Putin resorting to nuclear weapons because he's losing, right? So, um, so you don't want to win too bad that he uses his nuclear card, right? And then content again, you can kind of see those three contentions all connect and support your overall argument about why we should give military aid to Ukraine. So example, illegal prostitution at the Flamingo Motel is happening in our town. Should we close it down? Stop those prostitutes, right? That's page 103, 104 as an example. So let's walk through the seven issues of a policy claim. So you ask yourself, number one, is prostitution a problem? Well, it's illegal, but is it really a problem? Does it happen whether we fight it or not? Number two, is it a significant problem? Uh, I don't know. I think murder, there, there's a bunch of crimes I would put much, much more up there in terms of significance than, than prostitution. But... That's just me. Three, structural or attitudinal barriers. Do we have laws in place that make illegal prostitution a problem? Yeah, a law that makes prostitution illegal, right? Maybe we should just make it legal instead of illegal. And then the attitudinal barriers. What what are people's attitudes towards prostitution? That's an interesting question. I could I could I go ask Pew Research um, what people like. For example, do Americans support? Uh, prostitution, right? I can just Google that. So let's find the answer real quick. Do Americans support prostitution? The question is, 2020 survey, majority supports decriminalizing uh, sex work. So I don't know if that's 50% or 60%, but a majority of Americans do support it. So there you go. Interesting, huh? Um, all right. Then also, let me know if you can't see the full screen slideshow. Um, number four, could the status quo with the minor repair solve these problems? No. Number five, is the plan closing the motel feasible? Oh, so can we just close the motel so the, mo the prostitutes don't have a place to do it? Interesting. And then would the plan solve the problem? Or will the sex trade just move down the street to the next motel or to the next corner or to online, right? And, and then number seven, are there any ramifications to consider post the plan? Like what would happen if we closed down the Flamingo Motel? We would lose that motel, business, the legitimate purpose of that motel business, right? Um, and is there any, you know, there's some side effects that we have to consider that could happen uh that like you know protesters will show up saying that we're we're discriminating against prostitutes right so quick review chapter five five steps are used when creating an effective argumentative strategy you want to challenge your assumptions you must initially think the situation just might be wrong right don't assume what they're saying is true conducting research and or brainstorming to analyze and discover as many potential issues on that climb that time will allow we want to narrow potential issues by finding the admitted issues considering the real issues and then selecting the ultimate issues right the issues that will actually win or lose the debate for you turning down turning the ultimate issues from questions into statements and advancing these statements as contentions with supporting evidence uh, for your advocated position is what you want to do right i contend that i am the best candidate for this for this job right and the contention should have some some three or four 
sub arguments that all kind of together make it a really strong contention, right? And then organizing your contentions to do a case by making them the center of the debate on the claim and arguing them using evidence and reasoning is really, really good for organizational purposes. Remember, organization helps the audience understand you better. And here's a wrap up quote, in seeking the cooperation of other people, the basic steps are to define a goal, to obtain others' agreement towards working towards that goal, and to provide the support and revisions needed during the project to keep it moving towards your desired end goal. And that Mark, Dr. Marvin Glock of Cornell University. And it's really, 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 really true. If you really want people to, if you want to get something done in our society, you need to, and, and get people to cooperate, right? Because in a democracy, you need, you need support and teammates. You, you got to figure out what the, define the goal. And then make sure other people agree with that. We should go towards this defined goal. And then you provide them support and revisions to help them achieve the goal, right? So you make sure they have the logistics, the information that they need to succeed so they can get the goal moving towards success. Chapter six, evidence. It's the building block of an argument. So we're really getting into the nitty gritty of the our argumentation class now. Uh, evidence refers to specific instances, statistics, and testimony when they support a claim in such a way as to cause the decision makers to grant adherence to their claim. They, they agree. They're saying this evidence is good enough that I believe your claim. I agree with your claim, right? So in court, it's, you know, what people say. It could be DNA evidence. It could be ballistics evidence. It could be video evidence, which is actually the most powerful uh, evidence we have in court. Just jur juries see something they tend to make it make it super happy, believe that it happened, right? So um, we caught the Idaho serial killer, University of Idaho serial killer, because they used geofencing on his phone's location to figure out that he was in the area when the murders happened. Uh, and then they have surveillance video from people's neighborhood cams of the car driving around at a certain time. So they, they know his car and his phone were, were in the area of, the, of murders. Um, and then there was a bunch of other other evidence also making him a prime suspect, right? So, okay. So an argument is designed to persuade a resistant audience to accept a claim via the presentation of evidence for the contentions being argued, right? So evidence establishes the amount of accuracy your arguments have. Evidence makes your arguments accurate, right? Evidence is one element of proof. The second is reasoning, um, your mental logic, uh, and that is used as a means of moving your audience toward the threshold necessary for them to grant adherence to your argument. So that, remember, the th at some threshold, they will agree with you, right? We we don't always know where that threshold exactly is. You know, maybe it's 51%, could be 70%, could be 90%. Um, but evidence helps people move towards that threshold of acceptance. So information overload, along with misinformation and disinformation is a big problem. So you need evidence, but some people will provide too much information, right? And then it becomes overwhelming. You can't even understand and digest it all. And then that actually makes you confused. And then, so don't do too much evidence. Choose the best evidence. Figure out what the ultimate issue is. Like this evidence wins me this argument, right? You'd be surprised. A lot of other evidence doesn't win you the argument. It just, it helps you with the argument, right? But you're looking for the evidence that will win you the argument. Uh, like if this person is on death row and I can find a legitimate alibi, proof that they were not, at the murder place, right? So they, it can it could not have been them. Could not have been them. A lot of people are looked at. If you know the Murdaugh, Alex Murdaugh murder trials in South Carolina, this rich guy who killed all these people. It's totally sad. His own son, his wife, right? And um, they were using his. They were using lots of phone evidence to prove that people were there or not near there. Or maybe they put their phone in a car and it drove that way. And that person actually went over to the murder place and killed that person. And then they try to use their phone as an alibi, right? It's interesting. You got to prove that. So, um, but the but phone location data isn't enough, right? Because someone could just put their phone somewhere and, and have somebody take it the opposite direction. So you're going you're gonna to need some video and things that says that, yeah, that person was in this part of town or whatever we can find, right? So, and there's a lot of cameras out there nowadays. Uh, but in China, there are billions of them like everywhere all the time. And then in England, if you didn't know, there there are there are hundreds of them, uh, mostly against um, terrorism from the 50s when they were, uh, the Irish Provisionalist Army was, the IRA was doing bombing in Europe and, uh, sorry, London and stuff. So um, now sources of evidence. Let's take a look at this page 115. So primary sources. These are the original firsthand knowledge that actually conducted the survey and the experiment. So all primary services sources are actually rated number one because this is the actually the original firsthand knowledge of the actual evidence. Secondary sources summarize primary sources, offer opinions, and can be hearsay. So procon.org is a secondary source. 
they just summarized primary sources in their footnotes, right? And then they offer opinions. But the primary sources, which are cited on ProCon.org, are the actual people who conducted the study experiment or did the original research, right? So that's why when it comes to evidence, if you're quoting the secondary sources, that's bad. It's better than not quoting any sources, but primary sources is actually where you want to go to to understand the sources of evidence, right? I can ask you if you were at the murder scene, or I can ask your friends if they knew where you were, right? And so your friends are secondary sources. You know who, where you were, and you're the primary source, right? Because you would have first-hand knowledge. The types of evidence. I know I'm running out of time, so let me just check the time real quick. Um, I don't have my watch. Shoot, I should have my watch. It's a good way to know what time it is real quick. I have 20, 17 minutes. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so, and let me know if, I, when I, I switch screens around full screen like that, sometimes Zoom doesn't like it. So let me know if you can't see chapter six evidence, the building block and argument. So let's talk about the types of evidence. There are five of them. There's precedent evidence, statistical evidence, testimonial evidence, hearsay evidence, and common knowledge evidence, right? So precedent evidence is an actor event which establishes expectations for future conduct. There are two forms, precedent evidence, legal and personal, right? And this is kind of like what you've done in like continuities analysis, where you talk a lot about what you did in the past. And that guides your actions in the present or the future, right? Um, I like to fly direct flights only because when you have connecting flights, you can miss them. Play the weather delays, the bad things happen, your bags get lost when there's a transfer. So I actually personally in the past have always flown direct. And in the future, I will always fly Direct. Yeah, I, I, I'm i big about I think that's a rule of flying that you should always adhere to that when you have connecting flights, things are just going to go wrong. Um, and the airlines aren't that great about taking care of you. So I try to fly direct. Right. So it, it simplifies a lot of things in terms of logistics of travel. Right. And just, yeah, I'm going to do that do that in the future. And I've always done it in the past. Right. So I'm setting a precedent or you tell your children, um, let's set a precedent because they will they will think that if you change the precedent, you're being inconsistent or hypocritical, which is why people try to be consistent or continuous. And so if my children ask me, can we have ice cream for dessert? And I say, yes, then I've set a precedent that in the future, ice cream is on the table for dessert, right? If I say no, I'm not setting a precedent so that even if they keep asking me, I can actually say, well, in the past I said no. So today I'm going to continue saying no right so you can see that it's pretty how people conduct themselves in the past and they want to be consistent generally precedent evidence can be pretty strong all right number two statistical evidence this all of us should have some statistical evidence in uh student congress one two and our persuasive speech right they consist primarily of polls surveys and experimental results from the laboratory this type of evidence is the numerical reporting specific instances i just googled that the majority of americans oppose uh illegal Prostitution, they, they want sex workers to have legal work. Statistical evidence provides a means for communicating a large number of specific instances without citing each one. I have, you know, all these people I asked and the, the more than 50% say we should we should help sex workers and make prostitution legal. Statistics can be manipulated and misused to make the point of the particular advocates. So be careful of that. Uh, Mark Twain said, statistics never lie, but liars always use statistics. I think a good example of this is your high school GPA, your grade point average. It is true, you earned it. Um, but I'm going to ask you, is that statistic, your high school GPA, reflective of your academic and intellectual abilities? And I know a lot of kids will, or people will say, no way, right? I was immature in high school, right? So it's a true statistic. It's a number. But you ask yourself, how much does it really say about who you are, um, you know, or, or your intellectual ability? Remember, statistics also have to be interpreted. Terrell Owens is a Hall of Fame wide receiver in the NFL football, 49er, ex-49er. Um, his statistics were awesome. But what's interesting is he didn't get in to the Hall of Fame for a couple of years. And the reason was is because he's kind of a dick. Like he he treated the press and coaches and fellow players he had, he, with a lot of attitude. And people don't like him. So they kind of didn't elect him to the Hall of Fame, even though his Hall, Hall of Fame statistics are, are no doubt. Right, which is why he actually did eventually get in. But um, and by the way, he's tried to fix his image a lot because he, he, I think he realized, like, damn, I kind of pissed off a lot of people, and, and like that's not good at this point in my life, right? When I was playing that, I thought I didn't care, right? 
Um, so uh, statistics are often no more reliable than any other form of evidence, although people often think they are. It, you know, people put, tend to put a lot of value in numbers, like your high school GPA, when it's really not that relevant at all. Advocates need to carefully analyze how they use statistics when attempting to persuade others. And likewise, the audience needs to question statistics that don't make sense to them, right? Just because somebody has a statistic, don't assume it's true. You'll find out that universal health care, what does it cost? Or what would it cost? There's a lot of statistics, but they're all guesses. They're all estimates, right? Because we don't actually have universal health care in America, so we don't actually know what it would cost. But we think it would cost this, 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 this. And you're going to find a pretty wide range. Pretty interesting, right? So you realize that they sound good, but they, they're, not, they're not better than other forms of evidence. Testimonial evidence is the third one. It's used for the purpose of assigning motives, assessing responsibilities. As you remember, people giving testimony about what they saw or did, uh, verifying actions for past, present, and future events. Testimonies and opinion of reality as stated by another person. There are three forms of testimonial evidence: eyewitness, what you saw; expert witness, you know, I am an um, sorry, autopsy doctor. I forgot what those are called. I'm like a mortician, and I and I take dead bodies apart to figure out what caused. The death or what drugs were in their system or other things like that and then historiography historiography there you go so let's learn about them eyewitness testimonies the personal declaration as to the accuracy and event that is the person actually saw something happen or and they're willing to bear witness to that then they have to ask ask and answer questions studies have confirmed that eyewitness testimony even with all these problems is a powerful form of evidence right so if you're like I was raped and you are the rapist. I point you out in a lineup, right? That's that's very powerful eyewitness testimony. Um, although it could be wrong, right? There's a lot of examples how they've, like they used to put one black guy with 10 white guys and the woman was like, it's the black dude, right? It's like, that's not a fair lineup. That's illegal. That's unconstitutional to do that, by the way, now, right? You have to have like 10 black dudes in a lineup and she should or he should pick out the victim should pick out the rapist right you, you, they, you right? That, that was so unfair if you, if you think about that the old days so um and then uh, expert witness calls upon someone qualified to make a personal declaration about the nature of the fact in question courts of law make use of experts such as in forensics that's recreating what happened like often how people died ballistics is involving bullets and weapons Psychology is understanding, again, how people think, what motivates them, and why they would do something. Uh, the critical thinker uses the credibility of another person to support an argument through statements about the facts or opinions of the situation. What, who, who, who qualifies an expert witness? Uh, mostly it's experience. If you've done something a long time, you're an expert in the court of law, right? You don't have to have a degree or a license. Um, so, uh, but they'll, the, all expert witnesses are put out there and then the other lawyer gets to question them and then say whether they agree or disagree that this person should be an expert. But also remember the experts can also disagree. One of the first trials I ever did was a brother and sister suing each other because their parents died and left them the family business. The son wanted to sell it. The sister wanted to keep it. So they got in a fight and sued each other. And the big question was, how much is the business worth? And one expert said it was like $3 million, The other expert said $10 million. So you can see that experts can wildly disagree, right? So historiography. So this is the third form of testimonial evidence. In their book, Argumentation and Advocacy, Wins and Hastings write that historiographers are actually concerned in large part with the discovery, use, and verification of evidence. So the historian traces, influences, assigns motives, evaluates roles, allocates responsibilities, and juxtaposes, it means so you can kind of compare things, um, and events in an attempt to reconstruct the past. That reconstruction is no wiser, no more accurate or dependable than the dependability of the evidence that historians use for his reconstruction. So a lot of history is not true. We don't know what happened. Everybody who knows what happened died, right? So history, history is about trying to recreate what really happened, and a lot, a lot of that is we don't know. We, we're, we're basing it on things that, um, you know, a little bit of the evidence that we have remaining, for example, um, what's left in, in writing or drawings or, or things of that nature, right? So, but what we realize is that history is often written by the winners or the conquerors, and then it's often written by men and not the women. And those are the two big biases. I would, and, and understand that history is not a fact. We just, we just, for the most part, we don't know what really happened. Did George Washington really stand on the bow of the boat when he crossed the Potomac, right? Like, we, like that, that makes him look all cool. He's leading his men, but it could be complete BS, right? So, so noted historian Arthur Schlesinger. Um, the sad fact is that in many cases, the basic evidence for the historian's reconstruction of the really hard cases does not exist. 
And the evidence that it does exist is often incomplete, misleading, or erroneous. Yeah. So understand that his story is really just a story. A lot of times it's the best story we could come up with based on what we know. But there's just no way to really know if that story is an actual depiction of what really happened. Right. So, um, so historiography is really analyzing that and questioning all the evidence that we create history from and then saying, this is actually pretty crappy. So we really don't know what happened, right? So, okay, number four, hearsay evidence. Also called rumor or gossip evidence can be defined as an assertion, a set of assertions widely repeated from person to person through its accuracy is unconfirmed by firsthand observation, right? So hearsay evidence is what you heard to be true. Um, Bob told me Sharon's a slut. Right. I don't know that Sharon's a slut. Bob just told me that. Right. And I'm assuming that what Bob told me is true. I don't have any evidence that Sharon's a slut except for Bob said it. But that's just an assertion from his opinion. Right. So you really want to question Bob. Like, OK, so you said that Sharon's a slut. But what's your proof or reasoning or evidence that she's a slut? Right. Because I'm just I don't I just heard it. Right. So we call that hearsay evidence. It's considered a secondary source, not a primary source. In the legal world, there's actually something called the hearsay rule that says generally uh, hearsay is not allowed in court. We want the first, the original person who said it or did it in court, not a person that says, I heard that they did that, right? Um, and uh, But if there's nothing else, it can matter. And there's the example of something called the public decoration. So if you um, are in a car accident, and there's a bunch of witnesses there and you run up and say, oh, I'm so sorry, right? What are people going to assume? So if I say, I heard that person say, I'm sorry, it's hearsay. But I might say, hey, there's a public decoration. You don't apologize for a car accident unless you're kind of the reason it happened, huh? So that apology will be kind of used, inferred against you, um, which is why if you're in a car collision, never apologize. Because it can kind of make... Some people interpret that as guilt. So rumor, gossip, or hearsay evidence actually carries proportionally higher risks of distortion and error than other types of evidence. Remember the game telephone? You pass a message along. It's a simple message, but you go through 20 kids and it comes out totally different. It's a great example of why hearsay is un considered unreliable. Because what you hear, someone else say, and then how your memory and your interpretation of it, you realize that, that people change even the most basic sentences. However, outside the courtroom, it can be as effective as any other form of evidence proving your point. Large companies often rely on this type of evidence because they lack the capability to deliver other types of evidence. So hearsay evidence, not that often accepted in court, but in the real world, it can be pretty po powerful. I heard Bob say, you said, I'm a cheater, right? People, you know, they, they carry, that carries a lot of weight in the real world. In the legal world, not so much. And then a recent rumor was started that actor Morgan Freeman had died. And a page on Facebook was created and soon gained more than 60,000 followers after it was announced the actor passed away. Many left their condolences and messages of tribute. Only one problem, Morgan Freeman was very much alive. Uh, especially that was a problem to Morgan Freeman. So the internet's a very effective tool when it comes to spreading rumors. And you can see that the rumor is not true, but it spreads really, really fast. Um, and it's a good example of why you, you want to be careful of hearsay evidence. Now, common knowledge evidence is also a way to support one's arguments. This type of evidence is most useful in providing support for arguments which lack any real controversy. Uh, you know, they're just these are things that people accept as common knowledge that gravity exists. You know, that money makes the world go round. Um, you know, many claims are supported by evidence that comes as no particular surprise to anyone. For example, Americans watch TV. That's totally true, and it's like six, seven hours per day on average. And then the sky is often blue. That's totally true too, right? That uh, at least in California, I want to say out of 365 days a year, except for this winter, it's generally pretty blue. So, all right, let's look at the credibility of evidence. Just, um, we got four minutes. Okay. Um, specific reference to source. So does the advocate indicate the particular individual or group making the statements used for evidence? Um, and does the advocate tell you enough about the source that you could easily find it yourself? So make sure that when people use evidence that you understand that it is evidence, because sometimes you'd be surprised. It doesn't actually prove what they want it to prove. And then ask yourself, did they cite their source? And if they didn't, um, you can use that against them. So if one of your classmates is arguing in student congress and not citing their sources, you can accuse them of making it all up. They didn't cite their sources. So you should disbelieve all their evidence, right? That's that's legitimate. That's why you got to cite your sources. So qualifications, so it's not a great argument. 
just pointing something out that later on they could correct. I or hear my sources, sorry. Um, then qualifications of the source. Does the applicant give you reason to believe that the source is competent and well-informed in the area in question? So every time they have expert quotes on the opposite side, question, is this person really an expert? And are they qualified to give this opinion, right? Um, third, bias of the source. Even an expert, if the source is likely to be biased on the topic, can we predict this because of their political party or the organization she or she works? This is totally true. There is one doctor who did a commercial that said smoking is not bad for you. And all the other doctors were like, that's a complete lie. And then they found out that one doctor who was doing the commercial where she said smoking is okay, she got paid like $200,000 to say that. And then her house was in foreclosure. So she actually needed the money so she didn't lose her house. So that's probably why she 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 took the money and then said, you know, tobacco smoking is not bad for you as a medical doctor. That's my opinion, right? So everybody, all the other doctors were like, she's incredibly biased. And it was finance, she was financially biased, right? She said it because she needed the money. Uh, and that actually happens a lot, right? And then, uh, or people will say things because they're going to get in trouble, right? Like when people get accused of a crime, they often lie because... And you're going to realize that source is very biased because they're trying to save their own skin, right? And then there's factual support. Does the source offer factual support for the position taken or simply state personal opinions as fact, right? So remember, and inferences are not facts. So let's make sure we have a fact with the source. Otherwise, it's not a fact. I'm going to leave off uh, here. Well, done. Uh, I'm just going to take a note that we left off on 